Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, start the clock there. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Busco, here for another episode of the show. And uh, all right, so we're gonna start off with a red this week for our value wine, our under $20 selection. Now, this is a, a wine from the Magnificent Wine or MagnificentWine.com, um, but they're part of uh, a larger group. So uh, the, the name of the, 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 name of the, the, the main name is Precept Wine Brands. They make wines or they're, they're responsible for wines out of Washington, uh, Oregon, Idaho, which I'm interested in trying some Idaho wines. Um, they also have things from Germany, some wines in Germany, and I, th I can't remember where else. That was stupid of me not to remember that. But here we go real quick. Regions, Idaho, Germany, Australia. There we go. And they also have some other wines. So let's get into this one. Now this is um, kind of their claim to fame wine, so to speak. Here we go, here we go. How come, uh, there we go, sales tools. All right, so this is their, their um, oh my goodness, <laughs> tasting notes. Sorry folks, all right. So this is their um, this is their kind of their their main workhorse wine. This is their house wine, red wine. Uh, this is the 2009 uh, vintage from the Columbia Valley in Washington State. Uh, purchased it at World Market for $8.99. It's regularly $9.99. Um, Charles Smith, I believe, is the winemaker, since it says by Charles Smith, and. Um, We'll go over real quick what uh, what the uh, makeup is of the wine. All right, so uh, you've got 68% uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, 22% Merlot, 4% Malbec, 4% Syrah, and 2% 2% Petite Verdot. Get the label, get the logo out there. You know, branding and all that. Um, if you want one of these T-shirts, there is a way to get go to the website. You can buy them. I think. I haven't sold any other than to myself, so. Um, all right, so real quick, let's go to the, uh, just kind of talk about uh, this particular brand. Like I said, they, um, this brand's been a while, been around for a little bit. Uh, the history of the company, they've, they've been bought and sold or they've, they've acquired brands, so they, I wouldn't say they're like a huge, huge winery, but they're not small. It's not the only, this is not the only thing, you know, you know the label is all kind of, kooky and makes it look like it's just some, you know, some dude making wine out of his garage. In fact, the company's pretty big. They got quite a few winemakers that, that make a lot of wine. So, um, but anyway, uh, it's out of the Columbia Valley. Uh, Columbia Valley is in Washington state. Now, a lot of times people keep forgetting that Washington state, as far as the wine side of things, um, is really dry. <laughs> people think about Seattle and Western Washington and all of the rain. Well, in reality, um, that's only one part of the state. On the eastern side of the Cascade Mountains, all that Pacific moisture gets blocked and they get six to eight inches per year. I mean, we cry about getting like 20 something inches in Texas and we're in drought conditions. I mean, my goodness, they get, they only get 10 inches a year, at least in, in where, where these vineyards are. So these, these guys really have to work the vines. They, they use irrigation. And they're really working the vines. They, 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 it's almost like you know growing it in concrete, <laughs> almost. Anyway, um, it's probably not a good analogy because the soil is a little bit different. But um, you know they really have to uh, concentrate and pay attention to what's going on with the grapes on the vine. Uh, you get really hot summers. Uh, well, yeah, hot. And uh, the nights get nice and cool, and that helps with that acid and sugar balance. Okay. 
All right, so uh, let's go through this real quick. Um, they talked about the vintage, which is kind of cool when they do that. They said that the bud break was a little bit later than normal for 2009, uh, but they had a long, hot, hot summer. Grapes had plenty of hang time and experienced accelerated growth. So they harvested early, um, which I remember right in 2009, Texas did the same thing. Uh, they definitely had uh, early harvest. And uh, they finished the harvest pretty quickly, but they did say that that was good because there was a frost on October 10th. So they were able to pick the grapes before that happened. All right, so let's take a gander at this. All right, so, um, you know, color's good, viscosity, I'd say about a medium viscosity. Now that we've got wine coating on this. Yeah, medium to low viscosity. Legs are going down pretty quick. You know, decent color. Um, a little bit transparent, not completely opaque. Uh, rim variation gets almost a little bit of a watery edge. Again, I don't really have a white background to use, but the silver is good enough, honestly. All right, I immediately get that type of uh, red fruit, kind of dark red fruit. More of a rasp, raspberry, more of a raspberry um, component rather than really cherries or strawberry. Not much minerality or floral. I don't get, you know, there's, there's, there's a bit of earthiness to it, but to me, it's really dominated by the um, the raspberry aroma, and um, similar to like candied raspberries, uh, can, can, or candy, you know, ra raspberry candy, that hard hard shell raspberry candy type of stuff. That might be be like you know, nice and juicy inside, you know, have the little have the liquid center. So what I'm trying to say is there, there's a bit of a uh, processed smell to it. I don't know how I got wine in my eye with glasses on, but that's what just happened. Underneath the glasses. Outside the glasses. All right. Um, man, pretty decent, pretty decent wine here. Um, though I have to say one of the things that, that kind of struck me when I was tasting it, it made me think of ketchup. I never had that experience with a wine ever. Ketchup? Really? But I do have to say, with that said, there is a somewhat of a barbecue sauce aspect to it. So tomatoes and ketchup and barbecue sauce. So got that. I also, so there's a vegetal component to it. Remember, tomatoes are vegetables. No, they're fruit. <laughs> anyway, there's a debate, vegetable or fruit. I'm in the fruit camp, to be honest, but... They're considered vegetables in some weird way too. I don't know. Anyway, um, but there is a there is a vegetal component to it, and and I'm not gonna say it's because of the tomato aspect because it's really not. But there's a vegetal component to it. Um, but I also still get that the same bit of raspberry fruit part to it, and maybe even a bit of cherry. I'm getting more wood to it, so getting that feeling of uh, of actually biting into a bark, not not like cedar box, but more of that. Um, so kind of being out in the in the brush somewhere, <clears throat> and I can say some pepper components too, some like white black pepper components to it. 
know, pretty decent, uh, especially for a $9 bottle of wine, $9 to $10 bottle of wine. Uh, I think it's pretty darn good. Um, tannins are about medium, medium bodied. Um, sugar level, I'm sorry, acid level, about medium. It's not a sweet wine, so we're going to say dry as far as that type of stuff. But uh, I'd buy it again. I mean, and the purpose of this wine was to have a wine that you can have as a house pour. That's why it's called house wine. So this is a wine that, you know, you can go out, buy several bottles of it, be kind of the wine, your everyday drinking wine, that's pretty darn good. You know, there's, there's a lot of good wine out there that's just everyday drinking wine. It doesn't have to be 30 or 40 or 50 or $100 bottle of wine to be really good. You can have $10 bottles of wine that have, are pretty decent. So I would, I would say this is pretty decent. I give it an 88. I think it's a well-made wine. Um, I think it's really good. And I think it's good value. All right, so um, we're going to move on to the next wine. We're done with this one. We're going to move on to our premium uh, segment, and we'll see you in a few seconds. All right, we're back now. So uh, I've been wanting to do this wine for a while, but I've held off on it. And um, the reason why is you can now you probably have now noticed the past few episodes. Hey, those lights turned off, by the way. Did they both go out? Hold on. All right, well, actually one light, because that was the light that had the uh, one light that was all out. So now I probably got a green screen that's all fecked up. All right, so hopefully Final Cut can figure that out. Anyway, um, so, as you may have noticed, I don't have uh, a number up here anymore. So, the, uh, the, the grandiose idea uh, was to, and actually it was supposed to be this month, or actually it was supposed to be like this week, I think, or actually a couple weeks ago, uh, and then I was shifting it to September because I was to take a week off, was to do this um, wine around the world, wines around the world with 1337 wine. Um, and... Uh, so I was going to take wines from different parts of the world and uh, have it coordinate with uh, being between 1 and 2 p.m. of the local time zone. So right now in San Antonio, it's uh, 2.51. So it's, uh, you know, 1.51 in, uh, you know, the western time zone, okay? So get wines from Arizona or something like that, okay? Arizona and Colorado or whatever. So that type of stuff. And then in another hour, drink wines from California and so on. So whatever, when it's 1 p.m. between 1 and 2 o'clock local time for the wine is when I would drink it and do it for 24 hours. That would be 96 wines. And I was going to make it an even 100. What am I going to do with 100 bottles of wine once I'm done with it? And how am I going to stay awake for all that? I don't know. So I finally decided... It just wasn't worth the hassle. So this particular wine was gonna be one of those wines I was gonna be drinking uh, because it was an unusual wine. It's a place from I've never heard, not heard, but never had wine uh, wine from before. So this is the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to guess it's the Buza or Bauza, I'm not really sure. Uh, Albarino, 2010 from Montevideo, Montevideo, Uruguay. That's right, Uruguay. So yeah, we went South American, but this is not Chile or Argentina. They do make wine outside of those two countries in South America. Uh, Uruguay is one of them, and Brazil is another one. Now, I think they may make some in Paraguay. I'm not really positive. Um, outside of that, I don't think there's really any, at least major wine making done north of that because you're starting getting close to the equator and it becomes too close or too north as far as they're concerned. Uh, to make wine, because you really kind of have to stick between 30 and 50 degrees parallel. Uh, you start getting above 30 degrees or in between 30 and zero, and it's not so good for wine. All right, so um, purchase this at uh, also at Saglin Benny's, um, like from last week, uh, wine shop here in San Antonio for $22.99. And um, I'm really excited to try this. Now, a little history about the winery. Uh, they built this in 1942. And uh, they were trying to basically follow the model of a French chateau. So um, uh, 
They've been in business for a while. This family already managed the concept of fine wine. The problem is it, it, it it's Portuguese translated into English, so the English isn't quite, it's not like somebody, it looks, looks like they, they kind of try to get close enough to English, but there's a, a little bit of weirdness in, in what they're talking about, the words they use. You kind of get the idea, though. Um, but basically, they started in 1942. In 2002, they restored the building to have the same idea of using a, you know, the, the idea of how a French chateau is designed uh, as far as wine making itself. And uh, they, up, they really updated their equipment. And um, yeah. So they're using more modern equipment, I guess, than they were before starting in 2002. So that will also increase the quality of the wines. All right, so let's take a gander at this real quick. It is 100% Albarino. Uh, I don't have the wine notes from this particular vintage. Uh, they only have the 2011. Uh, and something to remember, South American wine and, well, Southern Hemisphere wine is six months ahead of uh, North Northern Hemisphere wine because they harvest six months earlier than we do. All right, so, um, but uh, sh nothing really should be much the same. I mean, it's... Uh, it's 100% Albarino. Uh, they have two main vineyards. They have uh, the vineyard near the winery itself called uh, Melilla, uh, Melilla, Melilla, and then they have one uh, called uh, Las Violetas. So um, that's a little bit farther away. And that's all I got on here, really, other than just like the 2011 like technical technical stuff, like acidity and sugar and pH, which we don't need to go into. All right, so let's look, look, look at the color. Um, Albarino tends to have this more golden type of color. Uh, it's not really like um, Sauvignon Blanc where, or Chenin Blanc, where it's really, really, really see-through. But yet, um, uh, it's closer to what a Viognier will look like, uh, and even Chardonnay. Um, it's clean, clear now. Uh, actually, it looks a little bit hazy, and they did say that they don't filter their wines. So there is a bit of haze to it, okay? Nothing wrong with that, by the way. It doesn't have to be clear or, or all that, but it looks like there's a tad bit of haze to it. Viscosity, low viscosity. Yeah, all right, let's check it out. So in many ways, I'm, I'm getting almost a Viognier-like uh, nose, but Albarino uh, too, which I should because that's what it is. But I get kind of a melony, almost honeydew type of quality to it. Some floral, I would say kind of white flower type of stuff. Like I said, floral for me isn't always the best, but sometimes sometimes I can kind of narrow it down. And maybe a hint of like lemon to it. And I don't detect any type of creaminess or anything like that as far as oak aging, which I want to say they do use oak, but I can't remember. Um, they use a, they use a little bit of oak. It's mostly stainless steel. It's a good crisp, clear, uh, crisp, clean wine. Um, I still kind of get that melony type of stuff to it. Maybe also a little bit of uh, stone fruit, peach, maybe apricot, apricot, apricot. I wonder what the difference between those two pronunciations is as far as like regional type of stuff.
Again, a bit of floral to it, even on the on the on the palate. Acid, I'd say, is medium plus, uh, really salivating a lot, um, but it's not razor sharp acid. It's, it coats the mouth. Uh, long finish, too, really long finish. Um, you don't really taste the alcohol. Uh, I think this was a it's a twelve and a half percent alcohol, so it's pretty low uh, alcohol wise, and it's not a sweet wine. I'd say it's you know dry. Pretty darn good. I like it. I really do like this. Uh, chill it a little bit. Probably calm down the acid just, just a tad. But I on, obviously, oh, honestly, I could see putting this with like a fruit salad type of thing. This would be a great thing if you're putting melons and apples and, and all types of uh, grapes and all types of stuff and you're pairing it with that and some cheese. Great stuff on that. I'm trying to think if I'm getting really anything else other than really the, the melon type of stuff. Uh, and the stone fruit. Maybe a hint of apple, now that I mentioned apple, might be getting a little bit of that. You know, I just think it would pair really well with a fruit type of salad, or just salad in general with a nice uh, balsamic, um, with some berries, there's this great, and some, and some blue cheese and pecans. You know, spinach salad, basically. Your typical, quote, spinach salad. I think it'd be really, uh, do really well with that. Um, I'm gonna give it an 89, I think it's a well-made wine. Uh, and uh, it's 23 bucks ish depending on where you buy it. And uh, definitely recommend it. All right. Now i got to try to put the replacement light in there. Hopefully it works. If not, Walmart, I'll be coming by to get a replacement set of lights. So um, we're just going to do it for this segment. Uh, stay tuned for uh, pairing food with wine. Hey, that's why I talked about the pairing here. And uh, we'll see you in just a few seconds. All right, and we're back. So uh, we've got this episode, not episode, this segment of Wine 101. Um, you probably noticed I fixed the lights. Not only did I fix the one light, the other light apparently was burnt out. It didn't look like it was burnt out. The bulb didn't because this is what the bulb looked like. Okay, so it looks pretty clear, right? And then I hold it up to this bulb, and you can tell it's all messed up. So when I looked at this one, I was like, oh, it's still good. Matter of fact, you can still see the... the um, the little inner the element in there whereas this one it's all messed up anyway so now i have fully functioning lights all right so enough of that and i just wasted a bunch of time there all right so today's segment is what are the rules for pairing wine what are the rules there's rules right you've heard about the rules you can only hmm Red wines with red food, you know, red meat type of stuff. White wines go with white food, so white meats. Well, yeah, I mean, those are the basic rules, and, and, and they work. They work for a lot of reasons, and we'll kind of, we'll touch upon those in a little bit. But, um, and I, I typically follow the rules, but I also look at wine pairing in a different way. I look at complementary pairing and contrasting pairing, okay? Um... Let's go through the reasoning behind the quote rules. All right, red meat and tannins. Uh, that's the first one I want to go through. So big juicy steaks and and big, you know, bold Cabernet Sauvignons or Tanats or Zinfandels, rah, Barolos. Rah, okay. Why do we pair those with that? Why why does the wine taste so much better when you're eating it with a thick juicy steak, especially, you know, one that's like a ribeye? Okay. Well, the tannins. The tannins in these wines are really heavy. And what happens is that the fats in the, in the steak break down or, or, or interact with the tannins. So they break it down and things kind of balance out and soften a bit. That is the reason why you do that. All right. Red sauces. Like, so we're talking about tomato sauces. Um, red wines that have high acidity can stand up to... Uh, the, the tomato, the acidity in the tomatoes for these red sauces. So again, it's, it's, that, it's that combination. Cheeses and meat with fat. So talk about meats with fat and the tannins, all right? Tannins also interact with cheese, the dairy, the fat in, in the cheeses. So that's why usually you're talking red wine with cheeses. Heavy bodied foods. This is more of a, of a, a style, not a not necessarily any, any one component in the food, but it's, it's, it's 
heavy bodied foods go well with heavy bodied wines and reds tend to be the heavier bodied wines. All right, so white wines. All right, so white sauces and acid or creaminess. So the white sauces, um, with the creaminess, now that you, again, you're getting this creamy or this fat component, so you think, well, well, it needs to be red. You can. You could do red wines with that, but now we're talking about the acid um, cutting through the cream, the cream sauces. Um, and those also, if you have like a creamy Chardonnay, this is a, so that's, so the acid's the contrasting, so the complementary, it would be creaminess of like say a Chardonnay with the creaminess of a white sauce. White meat and the body of, of, a, of a white wine. Again, white meats and fishes, so chicken, pork, fish, it, it's, it's a style thing. Again, it's a complementary pairing. It's, they, they work well, there's not a contrast. It's not, I'm not putting a big bold Cabernet Sauvignon with tuna. Now, there are some, comp, there are some things where people will pair Pinot Noir with salmon because salmon's kind of meaty. Pinot Noir is, is a little bit lighter body in wine as far as the wines are concerned, so it's a good pairing. Fruit and white wine. Uh, you've got that balance. So you've got, um, especially if there's a little bit of sweetness to the, to the white wine. I mentioned the Albarino. You've got the acid uh, and also the flavor would pair well with fruit. Fish. Now I kind of talked about fish. Acid in the palate. So you, when you get like that, um, like Sauvignon Blanc with uh, a lot of minerality to it. Uh, it can go well with the minerality of say like oysters, okay? You get that complementary pairing. You also get the acid, again, acid is a big thing with white wine because it doesn't have tannins. So it's acid and sugar that are what you're looking at as far as pairing with food. So you get that acid with fish. Trust me, I hate fish, I really do but I've done the pairing, so I kind of understand it. Salads and white wines. Again, this is, some of this is a textural thing, a body thing, you know, since white wines tend to be lighter bodied and you're pairing it with vegetables, uh, you know, with, with salads and with, with uh, salad dressings. Um, I mean, really the classic, to me, a classic uh, uh, pairing is Viognier with a nice spinach salad with a balsamic vinaigrette um, with pecans and blue cheese dressing and maybe you put uh, some strawberries or some blueberries or some raspberries or some type of berry in there, and it's, it's freaking heaven. Uh, put Gewürztraminer with that, put Gruner Veltliner. That was the wine I was trying to think of. Uh, groovy. You know, that's an incredible pairing with a, with a spinach salad. But you can put it with, you know, a you know, regular iceberg or mixed green salad or um, mezcal or whatever, uh, mescaline uh, type of salad. Uh, with say, you know, Italian dressing, or even with ranch dressing, you get that creaminess, and get the acid, you know, Sauvignon Blanc could go really well with that. All right, sparkling wine. Now, a lot of this, again, most, you know, sparkling wine tends to be white or rosé. You don't really have too many red sparkling wines, but they exist. But sparkling wine tends to have um, some sweetness to it, but you have the dry, but it's, it's a lot of its texture. Um, you have the acidity, you have sweetness. Now again, not all sparkling wine is sweet, but you have things like Moscato, okay, that are sweet. Um, and you get the fruit uh, aspect of that. And you, again, a complimentary pairing. Uh, salads, again, another great pairing. I will pair sparkling wines with salads. Um, that's part of a textural thing, but it's also um, the off dry or a little bit of sweetness of the salad pairing with the acidity of maybe the dressing or with the sweetness of say any fruit that's in the salad. And if you're a pure texture thing, fried foods. Um, you know, uh, a Texas, a, there's a Texas wine bar restaurant called Max's Wine Dive. They're very famous for having, uh, you know, fried chicken and champagne, why not? And it's the fried food and the bubbles and the texture. And besides it's chicken, so you're pairing a probably a white wine with chicken, that also goes. Um, and then the other thing about fried foods is you also have that bakery type of stuff. And if you have, say, champagnes or that or champagne method uh, sparkling wines, you'll get that bakery type of, of uh, aroma and flavor to it. All right, so dessert wines. Well, or dessert, all right. So 
Reds tend to go really well with chocolate. Again, it's the tannins and the fat structure in chocolate, especially if there's milk chocolate, and the, the, the fattiness um, tend to go really well with like fudge and milk chocolate. Um, whites, I put creme brulee because that was the first dessert that came to mind because you've got that, you've got that good uh, flavor profile with a white wine and a creme brulee, that creaminess. But you could do it, like say, with a white cake. Um, again, whites with white, but it's a textural thing and a body thing. You know, it's like lighter body desserts would go well with white wines. Um, you can also put uh, sparkling wines in with the white, uh, as far as the white category. Um, dessert wines, dude. Dessert wines on their own are just phenomenal. But dessert wines, you can put with just about any type of dessert. Um, I would still probably gravitate towards the lighter desserts or the, or the desserts that are maybe caramel, you know, have caramel in it or caramelized, um, creamy type of stuff like a creme brulee, um, you know, caramel, you know, caramel covered uh, apple, you know, caramel apple would be great with a dessert wine, okay? Uh, because you've got that, that similar flavor profile. Um, chocolate covered strawberries and, and champagne is a classic pairing. Uh, you get the you get the sweetness of the chocolate comparing, especially if you have a brute champagne, so the dryness. But then you get the strawberry, the fruit with the white wine pairing, and then you get that textural thing with uh, with the strawberry and the acid, and the acidity of. I mean, my mouth is watering, dude. Uh, the acidity with the uh, with the sparkling wine. Okay. All right. So now that I've told you the rules, let's break the rules. Pair with pair what you like. All right. I, I knew somebody that. Um, I put Chardonnay with steak, but I knew somebody at one of the restaurants I worked at would get a Pinot Grigio with a, with the filet that they would get. Okay, actually, I think it was a sirloin, and we put this Mason butter on there, so it's an herbal butter. And I kind of was like, and I one day I finally said, you know, I I kind of wondered what the reasoning was, and and pretty much it was the butter. Okay, and just she just liked it. She just liked the flavor profile of putting Pinot Grigio with a with red meat. Okay, it's what you like, um, or maybe you put a Cabernet Sauvignon with a Fettuccine Alfredo. Again, just I just try to think of something that was crazy, but let's again let's think about that. That might actually work. All right, you've got the fattiness of the of the Alfredo sauce, okay, and the and the tannins of a Cabernet Sauvignon. It might work. I don't think it would, but it might work. But you could put a, a Pinot Noir with it, probably would work. I mean, I used to I used to drink red wine. And it was probably Chianti, or maybe it was a Cab, whatever, with um, a uh, chicken Parmesan dish. Okay, so it was chicken. For, okay, so why am I doing that? But it was red sauce, and then they would put a, then they would have like an Alfredo sauce on top of the pasta. Okay, but the red wine worked really well because of how it balanced everything. The, basically, the idea is you balance the acid, the tannin, the body, the palate, and the sugar. So if the wine works with that pairing, go for it. All right. Now, when I do my reviews, I try to, not always, but I will try to think of pairings because sometimes certain wines make me think of pairing certain things. And that's something you should remember is that wine, most wine, should be paired with food. A lot of times I talk about just drinking the wine straight and not pairing it with anything. And I will drink wine a lot of times like that because I'm trying to analyze the wine. But you pair it with the right food, the food tastes better, the wine tastes better, everything's better. If you've got the right combination and the right balance between the two, between the two. All right, so that's going to do it for uh, this uh, this uh, segment of Wine 101. As always, I want to thank you for stopping by. Uh, hit the links above to friend me up. Hit the links below for the wineries to so visit them, and hit the donate button over here on the left. No, your right. I'm sorry, my left. Your right. Uh, drop a few ducats in the in the uh, in the pot in the pot to buy some wine, and we'll see everyone again next time.